I am delighted to welcome you to the first ever Nobel Prize Summit. This is the beginning of three days of discussion and engagement. We will bring together the sciences and the arts, business and policy, the young and the old. We'll hear from a large number of Nobel laureates. We'll hear from other leading experts in their fields. And we're going to hear the voice of youth and the political leaders answerable to them. And we'll have music and art and uh, even a Greek tragedy, as we heard. Actually, never has so many Nobel laureates met such a big global audience to address our biggest global challenges. And this is in keeping with Alfred Nobel's uh, legacy. Alfred Nobel was an internationalist, and he was that at a time when nationalism was uh, more in vogue <coughs> than internationalism. He uh, was concerned with the major challenges of his time, and he uh, decided to celebrate those who dedicate their lives to scientific and human progress. And today, more than ever, we need leading minds from across a range of disciplines to come together to address very urgent and very complex challenges that our planet is uh, facing. Challenges that our very human existence is facing. And we need those leading minds to engage with policymakers, those who make critical decisions for our future. That's why we are here. We want this summit to be a platform for critical thinking, critical discussion, and triggering critical action for planet and humanity. And when I say we, I'm really speaking of a unique partnership. And uh, that's why I am privileged and pleased to uh, give the word on to Marshall McNutt, President of the National Academy of Sciences. Thank you, Vidar. This summit could not be more timely. In the past 18 months, science has put in the spotlight by like never before. The pandemic required massive mobilization of scientific resources, of international cooperation, and uh, new cures, new treatments on an unprecedented scale. Clearly, as we can see from the situation unfolding in India, there is still much to be done. But we can celebrate the successes as well. From public health recommendations that mitigated the spread of the disease, to therapies that helped reduce the death toll, to the unprecedented rate at which the new vaccines were developed. Health professionals and scientists are making a difference. But now I urge that we bring this same sense of urgency to the coupled problems of climate change and inequality as this summit explores humanity's most pressing challenges. Can we reduce inequities to safeguard the long-term potential of all of humanity? And can we rapidly become effective stewards of Earth's climate and biosphere, the ultimate global commons? Now, the three of us are here because we bring our own institution strengths to this summit. The Nobel Foundation is world renowned for its recognition of science excellence. Everyone knows of the Nobel Prizes, even if you're not a scientist, and what they stand for. Partnering with Nobel on this summit engages the laureates in these issues and amplifies our message, broadening its reach. Nobel is one of the world's most unique and valuable brands. On the other hand, my own institution, the National Academy of Sciences, brings convening power. We stand for the integrity of science and the scientific process. We have been likened to a Supreme Court for science because whenever there are conflicting opinions on what does the science say, everyone turns to the National Academy to decide. We help connect science to society by informing better public policy and by communicating useful scientific information to the public in lay language. In a world where misinformation propagates, 
like an epidemic. The National Academy of Sciences is the trusted purveyor of accurate information. And we are also so pleased to be partnering with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and the Stockholm Resilience Center, Beecher Institute. These internationally renowned research institutions have taken on the coupled problems of climate instability, resilience, and sustainability as grand challenges. They bring together international cohorts of leading researchers across the natural and social sciences. Their scientists are part of a global network of researchers addressing these problems and contributing actively to important global syntheses such as the IPCC. Together, our four institutions are pleased to bring you this first ever Nobel Summit, Our Planet, Our Future. I next turn to opening remarks from Johan Rockström, who is representing both Potsdam and Stockholm. Johan, we're eager to hear from you about the current challenges, implications for the future, and why this is the decisive decade for humanity. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marsha. Well, it's obvious that here we're gathering as the scientific institution standing on the evidence we have for action. The youth of today say, listen to science and act accordingly. And here at the summit, we have, as pointed out by Vidar and Marsha, the world's leading scientists, Nobel laureates, experts to explore three themes critical for our future on Earth. Theme one, on solving the climate crisis and the nature crisis through science-based mitigation and resilience. The second theme on sustainable pathways to reduce inequalities and global systemic risks when environmental change collides with human health risks. And the third theme on harnessing the power of science, technology, innovation to unleash societal transformations. So why these themes? Well, the world is, as we all know, going through one of its greatest tests over the last 18 months. But in the next decade, we face something even more profound, the need to act decisively on the other two global crises, the destruction of nature and global warming, that just like the pandemic, have now reached a state of planetary emergency. We can no longer act incrementally. We need to act exponentially. We need to act collectively, and we need to act in parallel, this is a systemic transformation of societies, and the biggest lift has to be done in the next 10 years. The world has to cut global emissions by half to have a chance of landing the world in a net zero world economy by 2050. But this will not be sufficient. We also need to revitalize Earth resilience, secure the health of our planet. Otherwise, we miss both the Paris targets and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals targets. We face a biodiversity crisis. We've lost 68% of wildlife populations on Earth since 1970, in less than a lifetime, in my lifetime. We're slicing, dicing, and simplifying Earth's biosphere. We're systematically stripping out resilience. This has to end. That's the scientific message. And those who have done least to undermine Earth are hit hardest. Just like the COVID crisis, this is also a crisis of inequality. And finally, the fourth industrial revolution is underway and accelerating. It promises to change everything, health, jobs, society, culture, the environment. But it is still not clear if on aggregate, this revolution supports societal goals, addressing inequality and climate change, for example, or make these goals even harder to achieve. Mm -hmm. A grand challenge for science is to make the digital revolution operate within the boundaries of a stable and resilient planet and the window for a safe landing of the Earth is just barely open. Given these challenges, if you ask me, am I an optimist about the future? I say, despite the dire diagnostics, yes. This is a transformative decade. We are a resilient species, an innovative species. Cooperation is our superpower, and this is a super year for cooperation. The UN Biodiversity Summit in Kunming, China, the COP26 in Glasgow, the UN Food System Summit, the Super Year 2021. We, as an exponential species, we can act with speed at scale. If we get this year right, this decade might see the fastest economic transition in history. Vidar, what makes you optimistic about the future? Or do you share this level of realistic optimism? 
I do, uh, certainly, and as you point to, there are many reasons uh, to be kept up at night. But uh, we're also now seeing an unprecedented confluence of pushes in the right direction. Firstly, we're seeing a growing recognition that we need to listen to science. We need to listen to science to understand the major and complex problems the planet is facing. And we need to listen to science and innovation to find the right solutions at scale and at speed. There is movement in financial markets. There is uh, movement in industries. And there is movement in politics, as witnessed by the Biden summit last week. Now, that movement is not strong enough. We need to do what we can to give that movement further momentum. And I believe that this meeting, uh, the competence, the uh, commitment, the creativity going into this meeting will contribute to that much needed momentum for uh, our planet and our future. Marsha, what makes you optimistic? I think it's hard to be a scientist and not have a certain degree of optimism. Society has been in difficult situations before and science has found a way to guide us through the problems. Science is the one tool we have that allows more people to live better lives without some people being put back and living worse lives. Examples include the Green Revolution, which allowed the same number of farmers tilling the same amount of land to feed more people. Now in the US, more people die from eating too much food than not having enough. When I was younger, I recall hearing doomsday projections about how the world was gonna run out of copper and we wouldn't be able to transmit information any longer over telephones, et cetera. But then researchers perfected fiber optic cables. That not only improved the speed and bandwidth of communications, but they're more sustainable because fiber optics are made from glass, quartz, the second most common mineral on the planet. Or recall the ominous discovery of the hole in the ozone layer and concerns about increased rates of cancer and other dire warnings from the loss of this protective layer. Putting on a sound scientific basis exactly why this protective layer was being eroded led to the political will and cooperation that phased out harmful chemicals. The Montreal Protocol stands as the most effective antidote to global warming that we have ever had. If leaders just listen to the science, we can address the current problems as well. Now to you, Johan. Thanks, Marsha. Well, to round this off and to kick off our deliberations over the next two days, I think it's clear that science shows we must act and we must act at scale. Science also shows we can, as pointed out by Marsha here. Science increasingly shows also that we win if we do. We have a chance for prosperous equity, peace in the future. And in the midst of the turbulence of the Anthropocene, we see clear signs of social transformations as pointed out by Vidar. Sustainability as a path to a new modernity for humanity on Earth. This is what I would call evidence-based optimism. It requires realism and understanding of urgency. Above all, we need collective action, a sense of togetherness as collective alliances for change. We hope you'll find these days exploring scientific solutions and pathways to a safe and just future for all on Earth valuable and stimulating because we need, more than ever, wide alliances for change. Never have we had so much evidence that we have to become planetary stewards so we can hand over a healthy and resilient planet to future generations. So off we go, 